Chapter 4 Francisco and Almagro entered the main temple and consulted with the high priest. The two spoke calmly. After a half hour, they came out of the temple. A great scream rang out. It was the high priest. The fastest Inca runner carried a white torch and raced through the city streets. Then a swarm of people assembled and made their way to the city steps. They surrounded the square and saw their new king paraded on a high chair. Their supreme ruler of the great Cusco, Manco Inca. Some screamed, some wept, but as it was, the coronation began. In pomp and ostentatious ceremony, a festive rhythm of drums and flutes propelled the crowd's excitement. The acrobats jumped through hoops of fire. The musicians played their pipes and banged their drums, and the children of Cusco danced and sung in their colorful dresses. The Incas then unleashed a flock of birds from their wooden cages, and soon the sky was flooded with doves and toucans. Finally, a group of Incas gathered around Manco and placed the royal throne squarely on the top step. And with a smirk, Francisco Pizarro pointed and led Manco up the temple steps. Manco Inca, please step forward, Francisco said. The elders of the court bowed and placed the royal crown onto Manco's head. Then the high priest gave Manco a golden cloak that looked much like Atahualpa's gown. He wore it and faced the crowd. Resting on Manco's head was the golden crown that Atahualpa refused to wear. It was also the same golden crown that Tupac Hualpa had worn for less than a year. All watched. Manco's tired eyes told it all. By royal osmosis, Tupac Hualpa's lethargy seemed to enter into Manco's body and assumed order. And with it came the inevitable responsibilities. But at that moment, Manco only saw glimpses. His people, his deities, his enemies. They all swirled into one vision. He stared at the faces. The familiar faces. Faces he did not know. Faces of the very young that blushed in reverence. Faces of the very old that seemed disappointed and reserved. Faces of the curious. Faces froze in fear. He had complete responsibility for all of them. However, when he looked at the Spanish, all he saw were faces of pure and righteous evil. Those smiling evil faces that destroyed Catamaca in a single day were the same gruesome, grinning faces that now surrounded every square inch of Cusco. Suffocating spirits. Spirits of evil. Spirits of the damned. But beyond these faces, Manco saw one individual thing. The thing that he seemed to lack. The thing that was vital to live in. It was dark and red and it spilled all over. It was blood. In one single second, he saw the blood of the future and the blood of the past spill on to the ground and fall like rain. But then the vision disappeared, and Manco was left with the present. The celebration continued. The sacrifices of both animals and humans immediately followed. The Spanish yelled out and wanted to interfere, but they kept at bay, and they watched the chosen Inca children ushered forward and sacrificed on slabs of stone. Crowds dwindle as the secondary ceremonies continued. At the height of the day, about a million people crowded the square. After Manco was crowned, half a million remained. And after the main prayers ended, the crowd scattered to a few thousand. The heat lingered on after dust. Amazed yet reserved, Francisco remained quiet. He sauntered up the steps of the temple and stared off into the distance. He peered to the giant steep mountains that stretched on for miles at a time. They called the peaks Machu Picchu, and beyond them, 
a sacred green valley sprawled beyond to the ends of the earth. The green ridges of stone bent and sloped like undulating waves. But they were many miles away. Perhaps hundreds. For a straight hour, Manco too gazed at Machu Picchu. At that moment, all he wanted to do was run towards the mountains and stay there. But he knew he couldn't. He now was responsible for the whole of Cusco, the whole of his people. He remained immobile and afraid. He peered for solace. He looked for answers, but he found none. And when the ceremony had finally finished, Francisco stood and stared at Manco. And Manco stared right back. The next day arrived. Francisco approached Manco and wasted no time. He eased his way inside the temple and took his most trusted translators with him. Then he gave Manco a grin and went to work. It was time to experiment. It was time to see what strings did what. When the formalities ended, Francisco asked his questions. He started with easy questions, the typical ones. The question of where more gold could be found had been a trite one, but Francisco asked it anyway. And with reluctance, Mako spoke, and the translators pointed. Francisco asked the next set of questions. Who was in charge of the imperial court? What enemies needed to be conquered? What happened to the Hussars? Who were his relatives? Where were these rumored hidden temples located? What was there to be found inside the temples? How many miles were they from the river? Manco had answered every one. Then Francisco flaunted his hands and gestured to the whole of the city. They stared at each other for a long time. The translators were confused, but Francisco shook his head and the translators withheld from speaking. Don't look so glum, Manco King. As morning turned into afternoon, Francisco felt it right to ask Manco the whereabouts of the extra gold mines that he had heard rumors about, and Manco showed him without reservation. An hour later, Francisco put his men to work. Squads of twenty men went into the aforementioned caves and returned with smiling faces. The questions and approved answers were repeated for days on end. A few more days passed. Then one night Francisco and Almagro met and negotiated how they would divide Cusco. They chose an obscure part of the city and talked. No others attended, and both were very drunk. So what is it? What shall it be? Almagro pointed to the sky. He drew his sword and pointed to the North Star. Sixty-five, thirty-five. A line across Polaris, said Almagro. Like we said in the beginning. They stared at the stars. Their attention switched back and forth to the line. Do you object? asked Almagro. No objections, Francisco finally said. Then it's settled. One to fourteen degrees latitude, said Almagro. Fine suggestion, said Francisco. How about fifteen? I'll give you fifteen. That should settle a lot. So it was settled, and so Cusco was divided. Pizarro sighed towards the east, and Almagro sighed to the west. And each of the Spaniards smiled knowing that the other man was never to be trusted again. After Manco had been crowned king, I started to think about how long this would all last. Since it was declared that the city would be divided, I could only think of what would happen once enough time had passed. How long would this facade last? How long would it take to fall apart? I simply did not know. Though it wasn't said outright, it had already seemed to be a schism of alliances. 
a man pleaded allegiance to either Pizarro or Almagro. There was nothing in between. Men kept to their side of the city and drew their territories accordingly. Flags were hung and territories had been divided, and old Spain once again arose from its ashes. But before all of that, a tremendous peace lingered in Cusco. A peace of plenty, at least from its outside. For its inside, every man knew it was slowly imploding. But they never said it outright. I tried to find Soto to discuss these matters, but I couldn't find them, so I was left to ponder these thoughts alone. Then the day came. Francisco approached me. He handed me a sack of gold and gave me my orders. The payment was about half of what I earned in Kerimaka. My eyes grew. It was hard for me to believe. Then Francisco explained to me that I was employed to be one of Manco's guards. You're a very important man now, Sardina, Francisco said. He pointed at Manco, then patted me on the shoulder. He's yours now, Sardina. Watches every move. I assumed there were others more competent, but for Francisco, I knew he had trusted me. As he shook my hand and looked into my eyes, I knew that he found solace, so I went to work. And as ordered, I watched Manco from morning until sundown. One other guard accompanied me. His name was Escobar. He did not talk too much, at least not then. We gave Manco a distance of ten feet, and not an inch more. And as we were instructed, we followed his every movement. At night, two other guards replaced us, and they assumed their roles. The other set of guards, the night watchmen as we called them, came at sundown. I wondered often what Manco did at night, being that he did absolutely nothing in the day. He often jilted and his eyes would flicker from time to time, but that's all he did. Day after day, we reported to Hernando, and day after day, we repeated our boring task, returned to Hernando, and reported a variation of the same thing, which was God's honest truth. He seemed fine. He didn't say a word. At first, Manco glared at me. He looked me straight in the face and told me everything without saying a word. Then, as expected, he ignored me and never looked me in the eye again. But for whatever reason, I started to feel something I had not felt in a long time. It was a short and strong sympathy. I saw it in his eyes. Being watched every second of every day must have been a slow, disturbing pain. For us, it was a merciless deed. But for Manco, it was much more. It had to have been. When I think about it now, it was a horrible move Francisco had made. It made sense at the time, but had others been sober and thought it through, they would have protested. They would have screamed bloody murder. To do this to a slave was one thing, but to do this to a king, even a puppet king, was ludicrous at best. But fools playing a rigged game never truly understand the rules, and we were no exception. Then one day, all the bazaars gathered around Manco and walked inside the main temple. Later, Valverde arrived with sheets of parchment in his hands, and I finally put two and two together. Francisco had put the questions to an end and began to expose Manco's real talents. For two days in a row, Francisco examined his copy of the speech and studied the words, though he himself was illiterate. So he repeated the major parts to Valverde, and Valverde repeated them to Francisco verbatim. Francisco stood satisfied with a nod and a wink. He affirmed and performed the speech first with fervor and authority. The translators then produced the speech on parchment, transcribed it to Quechia, and spoke it to Manco word for word. 
and as Manco relayed the words to Francisco, it was as if he was listening to a favorite song of his youth. The next day, Manco delivered his speech to the throngs of Cusco, and with a gilded tongue, he recited every word. Great citizens of Cusco, Manco began. We are to welcome these spirits. They are good and holy. He sensed the thousands of eyes set upon him. Then he repeated the phrase again. They are good and holy. In all, Manco repeated that phrase three times, and in the shadows, Francisco nodded and watched. To his surprise, Many of the Incas accepted the words, only because there was nothing else Manco had to offer. Fear prevailed over reason, and it came with silence. And for a mere second, his heart stopped beating, for in that moment, that one instant in time, he saw his brother Altawalpa laughing in the clouds. But then the moment passed, and the burden of dishonesty returned. All that was left was the crowd, and the crowd kept staring. They are good and holy. Manco felt his presence slip. He slowed his pace and saw many Incas leave in disgust. He tried to bring them back. His eyes grew, and he pointed to them. But still, he couldn't utter a word of his own nature and it was at that moment where I understood the pain in Manco's face, for I knew that pain quite well. The pain that comes with ultimate defeat, pain of living in an endless shadow. After the speech, there was neither shrill nor applause. There was only stupefied silence. It was a painful and unprecedented silence, which no one on either side took for truth. The translators and priests confirm, word for word was spoken, no phrase went missing, and nothing else had been added. After the speech, every soul had left Manco alone. Only Escobar and I were present. I was surprised at this at first, but later I found that it was a direct order to keep him sequestered. The next day, Manco's wife, Kura, came to his side. She did not stay for long. What struck me the most was that she hardly ever touched him. She kept her distance and was never more than two feet from him. It was as if Manco was cursed. Escobar and I intervened from time to time when we assumed that they were going to give each other signals, but I knew her distance was not one of deception. Rather, it was one of disdain. And the next day, Kura did not appear. As the day continued, several more Incas came to Manco's side. However, they did not treat their king kindly. They approached Manco and sneered at him with cold stares. One Inca stood out in particular. Waman Poma, I think his name was. He was a stout giant of an Inca, and his eyes were wide and intense. He shouted at Manco, and Manco shouted back. The bickering intensified, and they came at each other's throats. Escobar threatened the Inca with his sword, but it did not stop him from berating Manco. I didn't know what they said to each other, and when I asked the translators, all they said was that they cursed and sworn. Then the giant Inca spat on the ground and left in disgust and Manco was alone again. During the times I had been on guard, I noticed that Manco had prayed numerous times a day. He prayed alone for hours at a time. He looked desperate when he prayed. He whispered secret words, words of pain and mystery, words that he held sacred. In a way, I was envious. Unlike us, the Incas had many gods to pray to, and their entire day had been devoted to them. The Incas had a god for everything, a god for the earth and water, 
a god of the mountains and sky. They were true gods because they were real. They could be seen, and the Incas were in constant communication with them. They spoke in clear and direct language. They spoke in the air, the rain, the rivers, and the sun and the moon. And unlike us, the Incas held their gods with more reverence and fortitude, for every breath was indeed a prayer, and they had never asked for recompense. The Incas prayed seemingly every hour, and their gods were always in accord, for they truly believed. There was no time to doubt. There was no word for doubt. They were too busy living, and their gods were still creating. We were sharing the same earth, but this was still very much their land, and it was woven in every vine. I saw the raw passion and conviction in the Inca faces, and I saw the same in Manco. It was right for him. I gave no judgment. I merely examined. All men need to believe in something. Then an odd morning arrived. I smelled smoke about a mile from the city's gates. Then I heard the shrieks of Inca women, and I saw Inca men rush out of the city with spears in hand. The Hussar tribe had invaded the city. An order was called, and the other guards commanded us to seek shelter inside the lower basement of the temple, while the rest of the men rushed to the gates. Escobar and I escorted Manco down to the temple. It was dark, and the only light that came in was from slivers and crevices from the outside walls. We stayed in the small room and had been ordered to protect Manco from any possible harm. We stayed in the room for the duration of the battle, and as assumed, Manco did not say a single word. We relied on our ears to make head or tail of the battle. I heard shrieks and cries, horses galloping, and swords clanging off metal. An hour passed, but by then, everything had been drowned out by cannon fire. The cannons continued to roar, and the heavy, pummeling sounds rang my ears. I managed to look at Manco's face when I grew bored. He remained stoic and beaten. He looked numb and resigned. After the cannon ceased fire, we departed from the temple and returned to the surface, and I felt Karimaka had repeated itself. The casualties lay flat on the city streets. We smelled the stench of blood and shit and fire, and when we came up, we saw the inevitable. Billows and billows of smoke hovered in the air, and hundreds of Hussar warriors lay dead on the Inca steps. The Hussars looked familiar to the Incas. Their garbs and head plumes were bright, and their bone necklaces were laced scaly. But, all the same, now they were rotting corpses, ready to be burned. Manco walked through the entire city with a lean, and Escobar and I gave him a leeway about fifteen feet. He sighed and inhaled the smoke and went through every crevice of the city for hours. He bent over and picked up a broken spear. But as he walked, he saw more of the same. As did we. More bodies. More blood. And the amount was staggering. He followed Manco and encircled the temple steps. Then Francisco staggered up to Manco. I heard their conversation. It was sparse and crude. Don't cry, Inca King. We told you we would protect your people at all cost. We'll continue to do so. Your friendship means the world to us. Then Francisco departed. In that afternoon, our men gathered a group of Inca men and locked them in chains. Then the Incas formed into a line and trembled and screamed while our men lashed them with whips. They were then ushered and presented to the temple steps. They were tried for treason, and I still don't know why. It was obvious that Manco knew these men very well. 
Some he knew as children, some he knew as elder statesmen, and some were his father's closest friends. But now they were mere faces, faces he would now have to execute. These are traitors to the state, Diamanko, a translator shouted. We ask you what to do with them. Upon hearing this, Manko averted his eyes. He looked to the royal court. Their faces were filled with rage. Then Francisco intervened. Do what you will with them, but our suggestion is that you kill them all. The royal court also shares these feelings. They are a danger to us. We suggest... Well, it's your decision, King Manko. And with a swift nod, Manko withdrew his stare and listened intently to the royal court. Their words came in mumbles. Manko did not sigh, nor did he protest. He merely signaled for the executioners. An hour later, the alleged Incas were all hung, and those who survived the first attempt were hung again. Throughout the night, I heard the sobbing of the Inca women as they grieved and moaned and sulk. But then the silence of the night took over. And with it, I rested. The morning after, Manco spotted Wamampoma from afar. Wamampoma's look said it all. Sardina and Escobar remained at Manco's side. But Wamampoma did not care. What are you doing? Wamampoma said to Manco. Manco gave no reply. Then Wamampoma shouted, You are not Tupac Tuwampa. You are a better man, Manco. Show yourself. Wamampoma grabbed hold of Manco's shoulder. Then he gave Manco the longest stare he had ever given anybody in his life. What kind of king are you? What are you, Manco? Who are you? But Manco gave no reply. Have you forgotten your gods? No. The gods are with me, Manco finally said. How about your heart? Have you lost that too? Again, Manco gave no reply. Then he grabbed Wamampoma's arm and pointed. He took Wamampoma's hand and pounded at his own chest several times. With a final stare, Manco walked away, and Sardina and Escobar followed. In his walk, Manco came across Kura. She was breastfeeding the nobleman's daughter. He stopped and whispered words to Kura that she alone could understand, but Kura kept silent. They stared at each other long and hard. Manko held the child and reached into his pocket for a handful of white rose petals. He threw them up into the air and said one phrase to Cora as loud as he could. Escobar intervened and ushered Manko away, but Manko rested and shoved Escobar with his wrists and elbows. Then Sardina grabbed Manco by the shoulders, and Escobar quickly recovered and regained his mount. The guards ushered Manco away, but Manco continued to resist. He repeated the phrase, and Kura's face glowed. She understood in full. Then Manco said the phrase one last time, and watched Kura's face disappear. I will talk to the shaman. Afterward, Manco walked for hours. He went as far as the crescent grove and swayed into the interior of the jungle. It was a place where the Spanish regarded well outside the city's limits. Manco sat down and closed his eyes. Then he went into a deep dream. From there, Manco found many birds of many colors, orange and black, pink and red, white and yellow. He knew these birds all of his life. He knew that they were gods in of themselves. Then he opened his eyes and went up to the tallest tree. He found a small wooden bowl and ingested its contents. 
His guards looked at him queerly, but they did nothing more than stare. And as Manko prayed, he dreamt with his eyes open. He let the dream run its course, and in it, he discovered everything he knew. In the dream, Manko tried his best to communicate with the birds, but they gave him no sympathy. He outstretched his arms and shouted across the sky. And again, the birds paid no attention. They merely fluttered into the sky and never returned. The dream continued. He found his future self, still asleep, still alive, still king, with the Spaniards dictating his every move. Through a puddle of mud, Manco stared at his reflection and looked closely at his own face. He saw that he had grown very pale and old. His skin was frail. His face wrinkled. The dream continued. Manco found himself on the great river on the higher plains. He studied the shadows and the dark green and saw himself amongst the new and undiscovered lands, the lands beyond Cusco. Then Manco felt the whole world tumble as he stood in the rain and breathed in and out. But still, the world spun. He tried to find the shaman. He walked for miles, through the great forest down to the slopes and rocks of the valley and across the whipping giant river. And there above, he saw the bird that he knew was the shaman. He did not need to ask for confirmation. He just knew. The bird was black, heavy, and mean, and it landed on Manko's shoulders. They talked for a while. Manko explained his fears and all that had happened, and the bird only nodded. Manko continued, but by then, the bird had had enough. The bird pecked Manko's shoulders and spoke aloud. Tell them stories, said the bird. Stories, said Manko. Stories, the bird repeated. And when it is done, when the time is right, fight. Fight with all you have. You will know the time, Manko. You will feel it in your heart. In time, you and your people must build a new Cusco. Then you will find it. Find what? said Manco. You will find your soul, said the bird. It has been hiding for a very long time. And from that exchange, Manco knew exactly what to do. He nodded and watched the bird fly away. Then he stared at Machu Picchu and Vilcabamba and sensed all their spirits. Then Manco woke up, and the dream was over. During the evening, Manco escaped. He assembled his companions and those of the royal court into a temple. By firelight, he made a speech to them. It was short and direct, and only lasted five minutes but Manko made sure every word mattered. And for the first time, he stared them square in the eye. We will tell them stories, all the stories. We will distract them so they can't help themselves. We will tell them the stories they love to hear, and we will let these evil spirits destroy themselves. Although the command was vague, the Incas knew what to do. Manco's eyes enlarged. They became wide and strong. And from that moment, the Incas knew he was truly their king. The next morning, the Incas relayed their stories. First to the market, then finally to the temple steps. Stories of new lands of gold. New tales of absurd glory. There was a new revived spirit in the Spanish ranks, and Manco knew that these stories had worked their charm. And day by day, Manco grew in confidence. He could hear it in the air. The Spanish were drunk with stories. He saw it on their faces. 
and he smelled it on their lips. More nights passed. Cusco still seemed whole. During one night, Francisco had a long talk with Hernando. It was perhaps the longest talk he had ever shared with anybody in his entire life, but he was ready for it. Though when Francisco spoke, he spoke in vague terms and in muddied and insipid fragments. Francisco knew what Soto did, but explaining what he knew to others was a grueling task. His ever-present determined demeanor was evident of just one thing. Things in Cusco would never be the same. Needless to say, Fernando was quite bewildered. Enjoy these days, Hernando, Francisco began. Of course, I enjoy them. You don't know what I mean. No, then tell me what you mean, brother. It's crumbling. What's crumbling? Everything. Francisco sighed. This whole situation... It can't last very long. What do you mean? said Hernando. This is your city now, Hernando. What do you mean, Francisco? I wish I could tell you. I wish you understood. The city needs a saint. And that's you, Hernando. In time, you'll have all of this. This is your city. This is our city, said Hernando. No, it's yours, said Francisco. Remember that when the time comes. Then where is your city, Francisco? I'll find it myself. But for the time being, enjoy it as it is. Enjoy it all. Hernando didn't say another word, nor did Francisco. The fire went out. They stabbed the gray shards of ash with their swords. Hernando thought of his brother's words. It was only later that everyone understood why Francisco left for Lima. And it was only later that Hernando understood the truth in whole. Hernando's truth was the burden he would soon have. To be king. To be the one ruler that sees it all. To have all the attention, all the power. It was a frightening thought. But Hernando hadn't thought of it fully until it happened. And at that moment, when the words were spoken, he merely nodded and let the words escape into the air. The words were spirits of death. Nothing more, nothing less. And when the conversation ended, Francisco sighed and looked up at the heavens. By a nearby fire sat Almagro and his son Diego. They talked for a long time. They talked about the rumors. They talked about the stories of Altawalpa's lost gold. But mostly, they talked about their plans for El Dorado and all the work that needed to be done. Five hundred men are enough, said Almagro. We'll have Balthazar in charge. We should get Pablo as well to man the second battalion. What about Soto, said Diego. Soto is not invited. Why? He's not to come, Diego. I don't trust him anymore. There's too much of a risk. But Soto has been your most loyal man. Yes. And that's what makes him so dangerous. He's too smart for his own good. You can't trust intelligent people who want to prove themselves. And I don't trust him anymore. Then who do you trust? You trust those who can only see so far. Those who will never stop and question. Those are the men who will die for you. Those are the men you trust, Diego. Soto used to be one of them. He isn't now. I see. You better. 
I know. But you must also know that the Pizarros are not to be trusted. None of them. Understood? Yes, sir. I told you that a long time ago. I know. Diego remained silent. His father seemed restless. There were too many things to think about, and too many questions that remained unanswered. But Diego asked anyway. What are we to do? Not a thing until the scouts return. Yes, sir. But what if the scouts don't find anything? They'll find something. They're bound to. We'll find El Dorado. Once we do, it's ours. And we'll guard it to the teeth. Just keep your eyes open, Diego. They stared at the stars, and they stared at their gold. But for the time being, the happy drunken Spanish gazed. For Gonzalo, he needed unfamiliarity, an all too human need, more than gold, more than control, and Cora was it. He grew tired of his fair Spanish ladies and it seemed for weeks at a time that his coyest nature of denying their invites only made him more attractive. He had his way. But after each session, Gonzalo grew extremely bored. They were too familiar, and they reminded him of his mother, for they grew too ugly all too fast. Therefore, he watched Cora at all times, and always from a distance. He watched her dance in ceremonies, and he watched her cradle and breastfeed Tito Cusi. It was the want. And for Gonzalo, every day the want grew larger. Of course, the obsession to become king was Gonzalo's prime thought, yet capturing Cora was part and parcel. A stolen queen meant that he was following tradition and the sight of her meant the world. The timing, though, was not right. She was never alone, and that in whole was the problem. For at all times, Cora was heavily guarded by the royal Inca court, Manco and his Inca compatriots. It was a frustrating circumstance, and Gonzalo kept extremely quiet and dissident. Later, he confessed to his brother Juan all of his wants and desires, and Juan merely looked at his brother and said, You'll get what you want, Gonzalo. As the rumors intensified, the Spanish forgot about their Inca king, and Manco took no hesitation. He took off his royal garb and hid among the Inca servants. In the evening, Manco stayed in between the shadows and stone statues, and spotted his former guard, Escobar. He found him talking to himself alone in the sunset while drinking swigs of wine from his jug. The night came, and the friendly moon was full and bright and orange. Escobar tilted his head and stared at the upcoming stars, and drunkenly, he pointed at them. Polaris, Cassiopeia, Taurus, Hydra. He tried to connect them with his fingers, and he babbled to himself incoherently. Then he wondered about the knights and the ships, and how the navigators knew what they knew. It was still baffling to him, and he concluded that there must be a god in all this immensity. It just seemed right. For something so grand, something this majestic must have... The words escaped Escobar. So many lands to explore. So spacious, so much, so beautiful, so... Then Manco took out his blade, crept to Escobar's back, and stabbed him repeatedly. Manco quickly pressed his hands against Escobar's mouth and prevented him from screaming. And when he finished stabbing him, Manco withdrew his blade and disappeared through the canopy.